to wind technologies and how it contributes towards climate neutrality uh, by 2050. So my name is Vasiliki Klonari. Uh, I'm a senior analyst at Wind Europe in system integration and digitalization. And today I will be moderating uh, our discussion. So please let me explain how the session will, uh, will run. Uh, we will start with a keynote uh, presentation by Carlos Eduardo Lima da Cunha. He's a policy officer at the European uh, Commission at TGRTD. Then we will continue uh, with uh, our uh, presentation session. We, we will have presentations by three uh, research and innovation projects, the Romeo flagship and Erican project. We will then have uh, a, a 30 minutes panel discussion uh, with, uh, with all the speakers and also uh, some poll questions for our audience. So please stay tuned until then. And we will wrap up with, uh, with a final um, uh, presentation uh, note by, again, Carlos Eduardo Lima da Cunha. Some housekeeping rules uh, to everyone. So please keep your uh, cameras and microphones off throughout the, meet, the webinar. Uh, also, uh, as you might have seen, the webinar uh, will be recorded. So in terms of questions, uh, Please drop in the chat questions to the speakers throughout the, the presentations and the discussions. We will be able to discuss some of them during the, the panel discussion. Also, you can vote with a like button questions by that others have dropped in the chat. Just to let you know that after each presentation, we will uh, maybe we'll manage to take maximum one clarification question uh, per, per speaker, but please but let's keep the, the longer ones uh, for the panel discussion. Um, so with this, I think uh, we can already start with uh, the keynote presentation. I, I give the floor to you, Carlos, just to uh, just some words uh, about Carlos. He's uh, is a policy officer at the European Commission, uh, DGRTD. His current focus is on offshore uh, wind technologies. Of course, research and innovation for offshore wind technologies with a particular interest in uh, circular materials, sustainability, industrial processes, but also societal and environmental uh, challenges. So, Carlos, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can see my my slides. OK, perfect. Thank you very much. So, um, oh, first of all, thanks a lot for um, the invitation to be here presenting. Um, I'm, I'm going to really try to keep my presentation as brief as I can. I think that's, um, um, at least as I see, I think that's, um, I'm just giving here a general frame of where the different projects fit in. Um, and I will obviously be extremely interesting to see how, how the discussion um, goes forward and how we can actually put all of this into a, into a broader context. So um, I'm just going to be talking a bit about a um, document that we, we published last, um, last year, which was on the offshore energy research uh, strategy. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about the different elements that are, that are guiding it, um, a few of, of the outlooks that we have, and I think that this will provide a, a very interesting place or a starting point to see how the project will be discussed and where can they actually feed into all those different points, right? Um, here, yes. So um, obviously, I mean, as any kind of um, policy document that we have published um, um, recently, we have uh, uh, everything is in the context of the of the Green Deal, right? So uh, the Green Deal is a, a very overarching kind of a document, but the the main goal of it is pretty much having the goal of having Europe being climate neutral by 2030. So have, having that in mind, we have a series of different other uh, um, either policy um, uh, papers or um, strategies or roadmaps or action plans that they actually feed into all of this. And they are dealing with this all encompassing uh, overarching goal of being climate neutral. So we have, for instance, here on the, on the top left, the, the biodiversity strategy, the climate pact, the methane strategy. 
Um, the ones that I think are particularly relevant for the wind community is the chemical strategy for sustainability. That's something that I'm going to be just touching a bit here, but I mean, the whole issue of having material sustainability, material circularity is going to be extremely important. This is something that does play a role here in the chemical strategy for sustainability. On the top, uh, on the top right, you can see the offshore renewable energy strategy, which is obviously, I think, the guiding document for the uh, for how we see the wind energy community moving forward. Uh, we also have the critical raw materials action plan, and if you see on the very bottom, the circular economy action plan. It, so each one of those adds uh, yet another layer on onto this, and they show our general ambition uh, ambitions on, on how we see things moving forward. Um, so the well, when you talk about wind energy as a whole, I mean the offshore strategy really lights the way and, and puts a very clear uh, frame on how we want to move forward. Which is particularly offshore wind, we really see it as an essential cornerstone of the energy of the future. Uh, there are different kind of uh, publications out there. I think I can highlight the, the ones from uh, from the uh, EIA that really puts wind as uh, one of the main energy sources uh, um, in the in the next 20 years. Offshore wind, particularly, being uh, a bit of taking the lion's share on on this on this whole story. Um, and particularly in Europe, I mean, this makes a lot of sense for us, right? I mean, uh, we are pretty much surrounded by uh, by different sea basins um, um, all, all around, right? pretty much like as, 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 as would be a peninsula. So um, there is a, a lot of potential to be ex uh, explored there and a lot of different challenges that comes uh, with the different sea basins also. But um, this potential needs to be tapped and needs to be done in a sustainable way in order for us to reach the goals that we set ourselves to. So um, giving just a, a rough overview here um, on the offshore strategy, I mean, um, we are dealing with greenhouse gas reductions, right? I mean, by pretty much 2030, so in nine years, um, almost eight now, right? I mean, Chrism is, is, is knocking on the door already. Uh, we need to be able to um, reduce our uh, our emissions by 55%. By 2050 is the is this incredible goal of climate neutrality. Um, when you talk about renewable electricity, uh, we are talking about uh, in eight years from now going to um, six. Um, 65 percent just to have a general idea i think the numbers now in my head uh, if i if i'm not not in, if i'm not wrong i think we currently are around 31 percent in europe so we are talking about doubling and a bit more um by 2050 we're talking about getting to at least 86 um, 85 percent so i mean you know like it, it's it's obviously in, in increasing challenges um, we also need to deal with the with the whole part of um, spatial planning. So we need to deal with the different sea basins that, that we have, the different stakeholders that are involved, the different industries that are involved in this, um, and also the stakeholders that uh, you know like is is the environment. I mean, it is one of our main um, stakeholders there. So we need to be able to deal with all those different interests at the same time that we want to grow um, um, the offshore energy production. Um, when we looking to hard numbers um uh, what we're looking at is pretty much trying to get uh, by 2030 to 60 gigawatts of of wind energy offshore we are current at about 12. um so i mean we are talking about pretty much a, a, a five time growth um and also get to about one gigawatts of ocean energy which is also yet another component that adds into this by 2050, we are expecting pretty much 300 gigas of, um, of of wind energy. So this just shows like that there is we are projecting a, a, a quite a quite a heavy growth in in, in uh, for the um, for the sector. Um, it's also important to to look into this thing that when we look up about offshore energy, we are always not talking only about wind, right? I mean, we're talking about a series of different uh, technologies. I think that uh, there's one thing that we in the commission like to to be very clear is that we are technology neutral. So we are we are not only pushing for uh, for offshore wind as, as as the one option, and obviously talking about floating end of and and uh, bottom fix, but there are other options out there, right? I mentioned now just ocean energy, which is always a combination of uh, the 
umbrella term for wave and tidal, but there's also floating PV, which is also an interesting thing that is that is coming around. Obviously, there are also the potential of um, algae for biofuels, but that's a different conversation. So, I mean, we all those different kind of uh, um, technologies they need to be taken into consideration. They have a place uh, uh, to play in this kind of uh, uh, in in the future of uh, the energy transition, as we see. So. Um, I mean, this is again just repeating a bit of the numbers that I had before, but this just shows that we have a very challenging way forward, and it's it's one that we really need to be able to tackle this. Um, um, well, the sooner the better, and most importantly, in a sustainable way. So uh, I'm just gonna be very quickly going over here the focal areas of the offshore strategy. I mean, it's a very interesting document. I recommend you, if you haven't looked into it yet, to just have a, a look into it. Um, but I mean, we, we tackle the issue of maritime spatial, uh, spatial planning. We tackle the issue of market um, uh, framework, um, and the one on industry value change, job and research innovation. Research innovation, obviously, I mean me personally, because I'm from research and innovation, uh, is the one that we are really putting our weight behind it with Horizon Zero, right? So um, when we look into maritime spatial planning, I mean, it's also about sustainable management and a coexistence. So we have a series of different actions. Those are not the only actions, as obviously is implied by saying main, but it, it shows that there is a series of different actions that we are um, that we are putting forward, uh, and we are and we are acting on them in order to make sure that we can achieve this challenge of sustainable management of maritime uh, spatial spatial planning. Um, when we look also into mobilizing the investments that that we need to to do all that, uh, particularly because we expect that it will be needed about uh, 800 billion euros in order to be able to achieve uh, what we want to achieve. We are also putting other kind of uh, different actions in order to uh, be able to um, really drive this uh, this forward and really try to do um, as we say that really have a catalytic role of the EU funds. Um, and what is also important is that I also have this uh, inclusive growth, right? I mean, um, this um, is what I think has been um, called in some um, in some other areas with like the just transition mechanism, right? I mean, nobody's left behind, right? I mean, something needs to be moved uh, in cohesion across the whole of uh, EU. And the one that I can really talk more about here, uh, you can see, is also a much more dense um, slide, is really the one of supporting research and innovation uh of offshore renewable energy you can see on the top right there uh top right corner is really the logo of horizon zero is, is really the one where we can put a lot of effort on uh be it with our independent calls be it by organizing different groups um and i really try to put there in the very corner of it circularity by design because things really something that's going to be playing an important role here all those different bits and pieces, they all, all play together and they have a, a, an important role to play. And um, I think you're going to see that all those different actions, they are sprinkled over uh, Horizon Syrup during, uh, over the current um, work program and over the future ones as well. Um, so just driving the message home here, I mean, uh, we're expecting a, a lot of growth. Uh, we want to make sure that this is a, done in a, though in a sustainable way. Uh, it brings us nothing if, if, you know, like in the end, we did, did, it, did it in a destructive way, in a way that it, it does not go with our own with our own principles. Uh, it needs to be done in a way that it, it's 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 a legacy. This this new technology leap. So just want to quickly highlight here. Um, I studied that that we published also last year, which shows the, the role that circularity has as a strategy for uh, for Europe. Here's particularly looking at, at at wind energy, showing how there's different supply risks. This is just to show how um, it's not only about circularity uh, because it's good to have a, a renewable system or a closed loop system. It's also about making sure that we don't get dependent on certain markets, right? Um, so I think I'm, I'm coming to, to the end of, of my um, of my opening uh, presentation. So um, just here I have a few selected Horizon Zero calls that I think it might, it might be interesting here for this uh, for this group. Um, there is a, a few on the wings, obviously the ones that I, I put more effort on. Um, the ones that um, are dealing with more on basic research, looking at the aerodynamics of atmospheric flow. 
Um, others that are looking to winds in the natural and social environments. We have some demonstration calls on floating winds and um, recycling and circularity. Also have some um, that are dealing more with the software perspective of it, which is the wind farm control. Also have some dedicated calls on ocean energy and grids, which I think is also relevant for this community one way or the other. And um, the one on sustainability, which is one that I, I'm particularly quite quite proud of, because I think it really also tackles a bit of, of the human components on this. It's not only about technological um, leaps, but it's also about sometimes the human bottleneck into this. And I think that having um, a call that deals particularly with the education aspects of, of renewable energy, I think it can really be something that is going to be um, shaping the minds of those that are going to be working ahead of us. Um, so having said that, I mean, here's just a um, short list and obviously by no means uh, completely comprehensive of the different supporting instruments that um, that we have within the Commission, just more for your own um, uh, reference. Um, so as I said, I mean, there is a lot of investment we'll need to do in order to get there. And I think this is really one of the ways how uh, we can make sure we um, we can tackle this at all the different uh, arrays and all the different constellations that will make this possible. Having that said, thank you very much. Um, and I mean, I'll be here for obviously for, for the whole seminar. So I mean, uh, 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 I'll be taking questions in the uh, discussion if it comes to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos, for, uh, for this overview. And for, uh, for putting us in the context of uh, offshore uh, energy growth. Let's continue now with uh, the second part, the presentation of the research and innovation projects. And uh, we can start first with uh, the Romeo projects. Uh, this one will be presented by Cesar Yanes. He is the project coordinator of uh, Romeo on behalf of Iberdrola. And, uh, and he's also representing Iberdrola in the steering committee of uh, Etic Wind. So, Cesar, I, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vasiliki. I'm going to share my presentation. I hope. Okay. Okay, I guess now you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, as Vasiliki was mentioning before, my name is Cesar Yanes. I'm working for, for Iberdrola and Romeo Project Coordinator. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to share Romeo Project. Uh, however, before starting this, uh, I'm going to start with a short video introduction on, on the project and, and on the problem that we, we are facing there. So I hope you can uh, not only see, but also hear it. We cannot hear for now. I don't know if there is already some sound. I guess you cannot hear it, uh, Vasiliki. No, you, we cannot hear it and also we cannot see it now. We cannot watch it. Now. OK, I'm going to try again. <laughs> OK. OK, I'm going to try again. I hope this time uh, this will work. OK. Are you sharing this now? No. OK. OK, I'm sorry. <laughs> it seems that uh, this is not working. No. Maybe give it one more try. No, no, no worries. Then I will go to the presentation. No worries. I hope this uh, at least you will be able to see my screen then. OK. OK, I suppose at least you can see the presentation. 
Yes. Okay, I, I don't know what has happened as, as always. Uh, this morning we have been trying and everything was working, <laughs> but now in uh, at the direct session this didn't happen. Okay, in any case, in the video I was trying to, to see or to explain to you the difficulties associated to the offshore wind, uh, particularly because normally we think about very calm uh, and quiet uh, seas, but it, this is not always the case. And, and for sure the maintenance and the operation of maintenance there is not easy. Uh, we are facing high distances to, to shore. We are also facing uh, difficulties in terms of uh, replacements or, or difficulties uh, because uh, we need to, to take care of the weather conditions. So as we seen, it's, it's not easy. And because of this, it's very interesting and very important to, to get data from the wind farms in terms of the monitoring and, and also, of course, the digital innovation is key uh, to achieve uh, reduced maintenance costs. And this is basically what we are trying to, to achieve in, in Romeo project. So. Uh, Going in, in detail about what is uh, Romeo project, uh, Romeo is an initiative backed by, by the European Commission, Horizon 2020 uh, program. Um, the, the, the action uh, had a total budget of 16 uh, million euros, 10 of them funded by the European Commission, plus additionally one of is funded by the Swiss government for IBM Research, one of our partners. Uh, the total duration of the project is five years. It started in June uh, 27, uh, 2017, sorry, and will be uh, finalizing in, in May 2022. Uh, the consortium is led by, by Verdala uh, Renovables, uh, and we have on board 20 partners across the whole supply chain in, in Europe, uh, from utilities such as uh, Iberdola or EDF uh, to uh, wind turbine manufacturers, OEMs, uh, Siemens Gamesa and Adwin at that point, uh, uh, turbine uh, components manufacturers such as Backman or, or La Lagoon. Uh, we have additional Additionally, three uh, IoT companies uh, uh, such as uh, IBM, uh, Uptime, or, or Indra. Uh, we have the University of Strathclyde that they are developing also important as, uh, questions on in terms of the asset uh, assets, uh, uh, of the impact. And, and finally, we have uh, also Tavala that is uh, super nasty in dissemination and communication. So said this, uh, what is the objective or what are the main objectives of, of the project? Uh, basically, the main objective is to develop uh, models and tools and algorithms uh, that will allow us to, to early detect, uh, detect faults uh, and also the diagnosis and the prognosis. And so then in the end, uh, moving from a corrective and, and calendar-based uh, maintenance to a condition-based maintenance in which the maintenance will be performed and executed, uh, uh, taking into consideration the real uh, condition of, of the assets. Uh, going into more detail in the project, uh, physical machine learning models will be uh, developed and fed with operational data. The models will be hosted in a cloud-based IoT platform uh, and will provide very valuable, valuable information for O&M cost reduction. Uh, in what uh, type of actions, for instance, reducing of, uh, the number of major uh, unexpected correctives or reducing the, the cascade failures, also allowing us to, to reduce the number of inspections, both for the turbine, uh, but also for the foundation. Uh, in general, uh, going to a reduction on the O&M cost, uh, for instance, in terms of uh, um, trying to reduce uh, the cost to up to an 8%. Um, the project was structured in three different phases. The, the first one was associated to, to the development and the pre preparation of the technical specifications and, and defining the project requirements. Uh, the second one was the development of the of the models and the and the tools uh, that will allow us to to reach and to get all the information. And finally, the the assessment and the validation of the different. Uh, uh, models that will be performed in three different uh, wind farms. That is Big Air and East Anglia from Iberdrola and this side from, from EDF. Um, the project started with FMICA sections in which we identified the most critical failure modes. Uh, we identified up to 330 uh, failure modes and then we selected the most interesting uh, in terms of developing the, the models for, for them. Uh, and, and then we started the development of, of the models. Uh, we created a hybrid uh, cloud edge uh, based uh, IoT platform, uh, based on, on distributed processing, uh, and also we, uh, we develop a, an O&M information and, and management platform. And, and finally, in the third phase, we will be performing the assessment uh, that will be happening by, by this year. 
going into more details for, for the new monitoring technologies, we have developed new uh, algorithms or, or detectors uh, for the main bearing and the gearbox. In particular, we have uh, developed uh, some displacement uh, detectors. Uh, also, we have developed a damage classification technique, understanding the failure modes and, and the criticality and the effects, and, and allowing us to take actions on them. Also, an unbalanced detector uh, detection system for for imbalances that could happen in the in the rotor, and finally uh, an RMS uh, variation calculation for for the system, allowing all all of them allowing to reduce the, the cost associated to the maintenance. For the bail bidding, we have developed two different different algorithms, one for the rolling contact fatigue uh, issue and the second one for, uh, to identify the structural health monitoring of, of the rings. And finally, on the electrical drivetrain, uh, we are developing a, a small scale test bench uh, campaign at the EDF lab, uh, trying to assess and to identify uh, possible failures on the generator transformer and the, and the capacitor. Uh, with regards to already existing wind farms, we selected for the, in the case of Viking Air 13 uh, failure modes, the most critical one associated to two different uh, major components. For them, we have developed uh, uh, the associated physical models, and also we are developing uh, machine learning statistical uh, models for them, uh, trying to, to combine uh, the results of both uh, uh, techniques. Okay, the the failure modes we are tackling uh, are the for the gearbox, the converter, the generator, the blade beating, uh, and the main sub beating and the transformer. Uh, here you have the the list of the specific failures that in the end most of them will be uh, leading to a major corrective. So the aim is trying to reduce uh, the number of major correctives. In the case of this side, something similar. Uh, we have developed the the, the failure modes. Uh, or we have developed the physical models associated to to these failure modes, and and for them we are also developing uh, machine learning models and something similar to for East Anglia. Okay. In the case of the uh, structure and the foundation, what we are trying, of course, is to reduce uh, the O and M cost associated to the foundation and basically the number of inspections. And in order to do so, uh, what we have done is to to validate the concept of digital twin of, of the foundation uh, with this uh, and, and also starting by, uh, with an uh, optimal sensor placement study and a temporary campaign uh, we have tried to identify and to see the real state of the foundation and trying to see how to implement uh, low-cost monitoring uh, methods that will allow us of course to reduce all the actions uh, needed for for a platform uh, in this case, of course, basically what we are trying to do is uh, to reduce the number of inspections. Uh, that, of course, is also a question for a health and safety question. Uh, but also what we are doing here is uh, trying to detect uh, possible failures in advance and also uh, trying to assess the real uh, fatigue consumed by, by a platform, allowing us uh, for a lifetime extension if, if possible. Uh, what we have done here is, uh, first of all, uh, what we established was a, the finite element model update, uh, establishing uh, what is the current situation of, of the foundation. Uh, and this will be used uh, for, for validation of the low-cost monitoring uh, methods. Uh, in order to do this, uh, we perform a temporary campaign and together with uh, Siemens Gamesa, we perform some uh, load iterations in order to assess this uh, situation. And after that, we have uh, developed uh, different methods, uh, low-cost monitoring methods, in which uh, what we aim is with a reduced number of, uh, of sensors, of course, robust and well-located sensors, trying to infer the situation for other positions of the of the wind farm in which we are not able to to store these sensors or we don't have accurate information. Uh, for the fatigue, uh, we will be using strain uh, gauge data, uh, and we will be getting the remaining uh, useful lifetime. Uh, while for the damage detection, of course, what we are trying to do uh, is to detect failures based on the uh, current situation of, of the platform compared to to the to the established uh, finite element model. Uh, here we can see the the details of what we our uh, partner Bramble is is developing. In the case of the of the damage, uh, we will be developing two systems. The first one is a, a status classification. Uh, well, the second one is a normal behavior model. Uh, in one of the cases, we'll be trying to use the available data combined with uh, machine learning to, to provide uh, real-time information on the situation of, of the platform. Okay. 
uh, with regards to to the uh, infrastructure to to get the data, uh, it's it's not easy at all. Uh, the integration of the different uh, data that we are getting from from the different areas of the wind farm and also the processing is very very difficult uh, because of, for instance, the heterogeneity of the variables to monitor, the multiple communication infrastructures, the different communication protocols we have uh, in the different wind farms and within the different uh, components. Uh, also, because we are trying to include the real time data processing. So uh, in the end, this has not been an easy task. Uh, this took uh, a couple of years to, to develop the, all of this. Here we can see the difficulties and, and, and all the system we are trying to connect from the wind farm uh, to, from the site to the cloud and there to the one m uh, platforms. But finally, uh, we have achieved the objective and, and we have uh, validated all the data communication and data acquisition up to the, the uh, processing and, and sending the results to, to the one m uh, platform. Uh, with regards to this platform, uh, basically you can see here the solution developed by Uptime, our colleague in the project. Uh, there are many, many functionalities developed there, uh, but in the end, it's again trying to integrate the uh, uh, different data and, and having visualization tools for, for analysis of the information. Uh, we have also some different analytics functionalities for KPIs uh, defined together by, by all the partners. And finally, of course, there will be some automated uh, advisory generation functionalities functionalities that will be sent to the OEMs and to the developers, providing this valuable information for, for the O&M. Uh, we have also developed one uh, assessment tool in the project that this has been developed by the University of Strathclyde, trying to assess all the results and all the impacts of the project. Uh, what is important here is that in addition to the normal uh, models that we uh, should have, that is uh, the site characteristics, but also CAPEX, OPEX, uh, and Phoenix, uh, we have included here one environmental impact assessment uh, module that will be combined uh, with the previous uh, ones, uh, with the previous models, trying to get uh, the real uh, the assessment of the real impact including uh, all the all the uh, topics and not only uh, economics um with regards to the results, uh, currently we have identified 22 exploitable uh, results in, in the project that will be exploited uh, by the different partners. Uh, but in addition to this, it's important to mention that we are uh, also trying to disseminate and communicate all the important results we are getting in the project and in order to do so we have created uh, two different training builds that are available in our website uh, with uh, some recordings uh, from the different partners uh, with uh, technical explanations on, on what are we trying to, to cope and what uh, we have already achieved in the project so I will um, I will I, I think it's important for you to, to visit the website uh, if you have time and and to see the, the different training builds. And basically, this was all. Uh, as you may imagine, it's not easy at all uh, trying to explain a, a five years uh, project in, in 10 minutes. So please, if you think that you can, uh, you want to learn more about the project, please visit our website. And also, of course, you can contact us directly. And, and nothing else. Thank you so much. And, and sorry for the technical issues that we have faced at the beginning. Thank you, Cesar. Um, uh, I see. Okay, uh, I see there is one actually a, a question in the chat, which might be quite quick to to reply. So I'll read it for you. Uh, it is as as for the lifetime extension. Do you think thirty five years or more lifetime is reason reasonable? Uh, okay, I, I guess this is not an easy question right now because we don't have enough uh, enough uh, experience in our uh, offshore assets. Um, I think uh, from now that uh, our main uh, or first aim is let's try to to go for this twenty five and most probably even thirty. Uh, going further than thirty. It's difficult to, to confirm at this point. Uh, of course, of course, our aim in general is to not only go to 35, but even if possible, going to 40 when possible, uh, perhaps by making some modifications or some uh, maintenance activities in, in different parts of the wind farm. Uh, but it's a little early to, to answer, considering the, the experience that we have in the, in the offshore sector. 
thank you. Just a clarification. So the project is already completed, right? It's uh, almost completed. Uh, we are in the last uh, eight months of the project, uh, basically on the validation and the assessment of, of the results that we are getting. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vasilgi. Thank you. And the, then uh, we can continue with uh, the flagship project. Uh, Isabel Victorero will present it. Isabel is an assistant contract manager for the flagship project on behalf of Scottish Power. Floor is yours, Isabel. Sorry, I was mute. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. I have been experiencing some problems with the connection, but uh, I guess now it's going to be fine. We can see it, yes. OK, great, thank you. So uh, good morning all, and thank you very much for the organization for having the flexible project and myself today. And as Vasiliki said, I work in Scottish Power. It's a company that is part of the Iberdrola Group, and I work in the flagship project. So in this presentation, I will explain what is and how flagship started, some of the challenges that we are facing in the project, highlights of the project, and we are going to save you the social media when you can follow us and keep, it, keep you posted about the stages of the project. So I would like to start saying what's FLAGSIP, because FLAGSIP is the abbreviation of Floating Offshore Wind Optimization for Commercialization. And it's a project that was born from a consortium of 12 partners looking to develop the proper know-how in order to evolve the industrialization of the floating offshore wind farm within the off offshore wind sector. And um, what is FLAGSIP in other works? It's a demo project of one turbine that is going to be uh, hosted in a concrete semi-submersible a floating platform with a power generation capacity uh, that is higher than 12, sorry, 10 megawatts. And uh, this uh, project is going to be located in the Norwegian North Sea, in the med center site that has a um, depth of more than 220 meters. And it's located uh, 10, between 10 and 13 kilometers from shore. And one of the main goals of the project is to provide an industrial scale fabrication that is possible reducing the levelized cost of energy to a number that will be under 60 euros per megawatt hour. And for doing that, um, the flexi project was awarded a 25 million euros grant from the European Commission when uh, we participated in the Horizon 2020 program. And I would like to highlight also that from Iberdrola, we don't usually participate in demo projects or single unit projects uh, for the sake of testing a particular, a particular technology. We are involved in this particular project because we are looking to assess the supply chain and, and industrialization of the processes to get down the cost in order to further develop the floating offshore wind industry. As I said before, we are a consortium of 12 partners. So within Iberdrola, we have the role of the project coordinator, and we are assessing the technology impact, impact and the assessment of the levelized cost of, cost of energy. Olaf Olsen is the designer of the floating platform. Acker Solutions is manufacturing the floating platform and the mooring system, and also is in charge of the installation of the asset. Unitech is taking care of the manufacturing of the cable and also will be uh, operating the uh, flexi project during the two years of test period on which we will be running. Then we go to the med center, who are the owner of the test site where flexi will be located. Core Marine is working on the engineering of the installation and transfer activities in conjunction with Acre Solutions and Unitech Center and um, CTU, the Technical University on them, of Denmark, are developing the modeling and turbine control. Uh, DMV um, is in charge of the design verification and standard applicability. IH Cantabria is assessing the LCC, LCA, and environmental impact. Zavala is the partner that uh, is in charge of the communication and dissemination of the project. And finally, EDF is looking for synergies with other floating offshore wind um, technologies within other sea regions, as for example, the Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. 
So as I've said, we have we are an international consortium uh, with companies from five different countries. We have Norway, Spain, France, and we we are um, a diverse and transversal team, and that that uh, gives added uh, add value to the project and offer the appropriate level uh, of um, different skills and capabilities in order to develop this project. And now I think it's important to take a step back and speak about why flagship and which is the background behind this project we are working on. Currently, the offshore wind industry is nominated for, for the by the bottom fix technology. Um, currently, we install the foundation in the seabed, which means that the soil needs to have some specific conditions. For example, the depth cannot be higher than 60 meters um, and other conditions like wind speed, etc. So the seabed areas that could accommodate these uh, wind farms are limited. Therefore, this outlet has given us to yes, look yes, for yes, alternative yes, is a strange noise. Maybe it's it's only me. Um, so we are looking for alternative solutions in order to um, keep using the natural resources that we have in our hands. So for that, we are um, aiming to develop further the floating technology uh, in the offshore wind industry. And uh, furthermore, some of the advantages of this technology is that uh, it can host larger turbines in deeper water and we can um, uh, install in areas with a higher average of wind speeds. But as other projects, we are facing also quite a few challenges. So um, we still need to achieve a higher level of maturity for the floating option wind technologies. Uh, in order to develop proper and replicable technology in different geographical areas. Uh, the supply chain need to grow in order to accommodate a higher fabrication demand. And finally, one of the most important, we need uh, to decrease the levelized cost of energy of this technology under 60 euros per megawatt hour uh, in order to be able to compete with the big technology. And now in relation with the challenge that we have shown, uh, we are um, uh, presenting here some of the expected outputs of the project, trying to face some of them. So um, we are uh, testing the supply chain for concrete solution and we are aiming to become a reference point along the floating technologies by achieving an appropriate level of maturity of this um, new industry. We are creating the know-how from the actual development, construction and operation phases of a life project. We are and we will be experiencing all the phases of a standard commercial project, but with the particularity that we, understand, we are starting from scratch. Um, we are building the models and experiencing all the new phases uh, that will allow us to develop this technology and get all the knowledge that we need to progress further. And we are also looking for um, a, um, estimate, an estimation of the levelized cost of energy for different marine regions, as for example, the North Sea, Baltic Sea, Mediterranean Sea, etc. And in addition, we are accelerating in a promising market for floating projects in Europe. Now, I would like to introduce you some highlights of the project. We are constructing a full scale of more than 10 megawatts turbine on a full scale platform. We are developing a um, fully concrete platform with, which has a four pontoons. So in the center, we, we are hosting uh, the turbine in one of these pontoons and it's surrounded by other three pontoons in a symmetric layout. Uh, we are also developing the control system for optimizing uh, the power generation. We are also making some innovation in the dynamic cable. And finally, uh, we have created, and, it's, and I think this is very important and very useful for the project, if and the future uh, digital twin turbines in order to replicate the platform um, in different scales in other different sea regions. Um, here, uh, in, this is, in, in this slide, you can see some of the key technology areas of the project. I would like to highlight that the floating platform is being manufactured in a dry dock that allows a uh, 420 meters drop, and um, that the tower and the turbine will be installed while the floating platform is in the dry dock seated in the seabed. 
and um, which is the status of the project uh, nowadays. So currently, we are we have completed the front front end engineering and design phase. We have finished the basic design uh, of the platform and outfitting system. We have finished the tower design of the turbine. Um, we have pro further progress with the control F of the turbine. Uh, we have the floating platform construction procedure in place, and we have built the digital trim turbines model to sim simulate in different areas how will be the behavior of this uh, technology. The next steps that we are planning in the project are the cable qualification. That is a project uh, process that is, is still running. Um, we aim to set up the ONM strategy to freeze the grid connection strategy. We are consolidating the procurement plan and challenging the supply chain in order to assess the serial production. And we are drafting the business cases. Uh, and yes, to finish, and if you would like to, to know more about this project, you can find us in our website, uh, LinkedIn page, and Twitter account. And that's everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you very much Isabel. Uh, so I see no. Yes, I see actually a clarification question that just arrived. So, what is the schedule okay. of flagship projects? about construction, installation, grid connection. Okay, yeah, so we started in September 2020. Uh, now we have finished with engineering, so um, we expect uh, for uh, the third quarter of the next year to start with the construction and to be installed in the test site around uh, in the second quarter, third quarter of 2024. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Let's now move on with the third presentation. Uh, this will be about the Elican project by Javier Nieto, uh, who is an offshore division manager at Esteco. So I give the floor to you. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't muted. Yes. Thank you, Vasiliki, and, and thank you also to the organizers for providing us the, the opportunity to, to present the project here. I'm going to share my screen. And then I will. I think I will sh switch off my camera so that you can focus on on these slides and not on my face, maybe. Okay. You see my screen now. Yes. yes. Not anymore. Sorry about that. No, it should be fine. I I forgot to to share the uh, the audio as well. Okay. As mentioned, thank, thank you. I'm going to present the, the, the Elican project. This is a, a project which has demonstrated a, a gravity-based system for offshore wind foundations. And first of all, please let me take one minute to, to tell you who we are and where we come from, okay? Because I think it's important to, to give some framework to, to the project. As TACO, we are an SME. We, we are 50 years old now, and we have been for more than 25 years in the energy business, mainly in, in onshore wind, but also in other disciplines as the ones you are, you are seeing on the screen. And particularly in, in the last 10, 12 years, we, we have been developing uh, proprietary technologies for, for offshore wind substructures, okay? One of them is the, the ELISA technology in which the Elican project was, was based. And I'm going to give you just a, a few highlights of, of it. Okay, it is a concrete substructure and, and it has two key features. Okay, one of them is that the, the base of the structure is sail floating during transport and installation, like, like it happens with uh, concrete cases for, for port infrastructure. Okay, and the second feature is that it incorporates a, a telescopic tower with uh, high hydraulic strand jacks, which uh, allow to lower the center of gravity 
and therefore uh, two things. One is that we are able to install the turbine onshore and then tow the whole system to the final site with, without the need of heavy lift uh, vessels or, or cranes. Okay. The way we have demonstrated the technology is precisely the, the, the Elican project, which is now finished. Okay, and, and the main technical output is that we have uh, an, an offshore turbine in, in operation. It is, it is the first one in, in, in Spain and also the, the first one which has been installed without uh, heavy lift uh, vessels. Okay, the project was funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 program and we were partnering with key uh, companies in, in, in sector like uh, Siemens Gamesa for, for the turbine, ALE, the heavy lifters, Devi, and of course uh, Blocan, which is the re research area in which the, the demo unit was installed, okay? And as an image is worth uh, a thousand words, I'm, I'm going to share a, a video summarizing the, 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 the project, okay? I hope that the, the, the audio works, but please let me know otherwise. Thank you. ELISA is a technology for bottom-fixed offshore wind substructures bound to disrupt the market, as for the first time ever, allows full onshore pre-assembly of complete substructure and turbine units, which can be installed offshore with no need for any heavy lift maritime means. It has now been fully demonstrated with a 5 megawatt prototype in Canary, Spain. Elisa is made of concrete and uses a gravity-based foundation platform which is self-floating during the installation process. A platform construction rate of 50 to 70 units per year can be achieved for commercial wind farms. The platform incorporates a disruptive auto-lift telescopic tower made of precast concrete panels. These are manufactured in parallel to the foundation platform and are moved by truck to the tower assembly position. The precast panels form the tower sections in a fast operation with conventional cranes. The processes are analogous to those used in the 1,600 precast concrete towers engineered by Esteco, which are operating around the world. Construction rates of one tower per week can be easily met. Lifting tests are carried out in harbour for the fine-tuning of the system. The tower lift is based on conventional heavy lift strand jacks placed in the access platform and remotely operated. They are recovered and reused in different units. The first astonishing innovation comes now. The rotor and blades are fully assembled on shore. The telescopic tower reduces the assembly height, making it possible to use commercial cranes. The full assembly and pre-commissioning happens in controlled harbour environment, thus reducing risk and enhancing possibilities for industrialization. To reduce the base size while keeping the whole set stable during towing, an auxiliary platform is used. Thanks to its ability to couple with the tower, an adapted configuration of the platform will also serve for vessel-free large corrective operations Then, in-harbour towing and ballasting tests are done prior to moving to open waters. This allows checking in advance most of the key functional parameters, as stresses, inclinations and accelerations are already monitored. After everything is fully checked, towing happens with only one conventional tugboat. This is the second major novelty. The final site is reached without using heavy lift means. This bypasses the constraints associated with the availability of these means and even those associated with country regulations limiting the use of imported vessels like the Jones Act in the US. Once on site, two extra tugboats are added to ensure positioning and the ballasting process commences till touchdown in a controlled manner. Everything is monitored and remotely operated from a control vessel. When the structure rests on the seabed, the TIM platform is removed. It goes back to pick up the next tower. The 
final operation consists in completing the lifting, reaching the final operating hub height. Then power cable connection happens as in any other system and the turbine is ready to operate. The end result is a fully certified offshore wind turbine up and running normally, but having saved many offshore installation risks. Besides, the use of concrete allows easy scalability, reduces carbon footprint, increases local content, brings down the cost and provides a robust substructure with minimum maintenance needs. This is ELISA technology. Okay, let's see which have been the, the main outputs of, of the project and, and particularly those uh, regarding sustainability, given the, the session we are in right now. OK, as, as mentioned in, in the video, first of all, we, we have a, 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 a significant uh, cost reduction because of the independence of heavy lift means. And we are very intensive in, in, in local content. OK, as you can see on, on, on the pictures on, on the right, what we, we are achieving is a, a simpler installation with uh, conventional tugboats instead of the large jacket vessels and, and cranes re required for conventional solutions. OK. As mentioned, local content is nearly 100 percent. OK, in, in the case of, of, of the demo unit in, in the Canaries, it represented 90% uh, of the direct cost if we exclude the uh, turbine supply and up to 29 local companies were directly involved okay apart from those obviously involved in indirectly in, in in a project like this we also consider that we we reduce the the environmental impact okay we we have made our, our own research in, in in that regard and of course uh, uh, this kind of researches that depend on, on 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 who performs them, but uh, we we think that that the figures of of uh, gravity based in 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 general uh, are are in general uh, better, and and with the Elisa technology, we we think we are even a bit below again because of. The, the the less uh, carbon uh, footprint uh, link to the, to the installation process. OK, there are other kind of outputs which are important. OK, of course, one is that thanks to the European Commission funding and, and, and this project in particular, we, we have been able to navigate what is called the Valley of Death. OK, which, as you may know, it's the transition be between the the initial demonstration and, and, and the commercial deployment, okay, that's that's a, a critical stage in which it is difficult to, to to get funding from the private sector. So projects like like this and, and funding from from the European Commission is is crucial. Okay. And last and another kind of out, outcome which is important is that this project, which is already finished has been a tractor for, for additional uh, R&D projects funded by the European Commission. OK, here you have a, a picture of all of them, one linked with with uh, monitoring with, with drones, uh, another one uh, linked with uh, scar protection with an, an innovative system with tires, another one uh, with uh, global monitoring, and, and the last one, which, by the way, we will be presenting in, in the Electric City uh, next month in Copenhagen, uh, link it with uh, an innovative system for OEM, OEM, OK? OK, that was all from, from my side. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Javier, for uh, the nice presentation, the video about Elisa, and uh, looking forward to meeting you at Copenhagen, as, as you said. There is a question actually in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you have seen it. The first the, it is actually about the telescopic unit and if it can be used for operations as well. For, for operations, uh, well, yeah, I think I understand. 
if it's left yes. inside the tower to be used. Yes, in yes, the, the, the part, part of the system, which, uh, well, the hydraulic jacks themselves are, are removed after each ins installation, okay, but they can be brought back for for either uh, maintenance or, or decommissioning, okay. Okay, thank you. There is also a second question, and the third, I think, we will anyway discuss it uh, now with uh, starting the panel discussion. So uh, the second one is about the max targeted uh, water depth for uh, for Adisa technology. Okay, we, we we have targeted to 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 reach that uh, barrier in in which it is generally accepted that floating wind is a solution. Okay, so particularly we have developed designs up to sixty five meter depth. And of course, not not with the turbine, the five megawatt turbine that we used uh, for this demo unit, which started in 2015, but the larger ones, uh, the 12 and plus platforms that are currently being considered. Okay, thank you. So I You're suggest welcome. that we 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 start with uh, with our panel discussion, and I suggest that all the speakers maybe turn on their cameras because there there will be questions for all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, you, you all of you presented um, an overview of the different challenges that you had in the projects or that you expect to have in the project, Isabel. Um, I wanted maybe to ask each one of you to, to give us what do you think is the major, what would you mention as the major challenge uh, per project? And also maybe to um, to expand a bit because I think this is anyway going to be a, a challenge uh, in terms of when to make so the technologies have been proven or or uh, will be proven so to make them transferable to other setups and other and with other uh, technologies uh, what steps will will be needed and, and um, do you think that the cost of these will be justifiable? compared to the to what can be brought as a benefit a potential o m cost reduction in the case of romeo or in the case or uh, installation cost reduction i suppose in the case of elican so maybe we start with you cesar if okay for you. okay uh well first of all answering the the first question for us uh, the major challenge of the project was the uh, data uh, ownership uh, we are using data for our algorithms and, uh, and our models. And as you know, uh, <laughs> the property of the honesty of the data is not always an easy point. Uh, there were some initial discussions and conversations between the OEMs, uh, the utilities, and the companies that they were going to use uh, the data. So although it, it was not an easy task, but in the end, uh, we uh, were able to reach uh, agreements on this uh, use of data. And I think this is very, very uh, a very good lesson for, for the sector that in the end, if we are able to, to, to share data and to collaborate collaborate together, we will be reaching uh, objectives. Although, of course, we need to keep always uh, the confidentiality and and the competitiveness of, of the different uh, companies. Um, and uh, with regards to the second question about the possibility of expanding this to, to other projects or, or wind farms, uh, in our case, I think it's uh, relatively easy. I mean, of course, we will need to to make uh, modifications on the different algorithms and models uh, because we need to uh, adapt them uh, for the different uh, turbines and for the different uh, sites. But it, this is something that can be done. So it will be needed, of course, to dedicate some time, but this is possible to be done. Also, it's important that we, uh, in the period, we have the objective of not only developing these algorithms for, for offshore, uh, but also trying to transfer them or to port them to to the onshore sector when when possible, and I think this is uh, this is good uh, for the project. And for sure, we will try, or the algorithms will be most probably ported, uh, because in the end they will be bringing uh, uh, cost, uh, operational maintenance cost reductions. And a very good example for that will be the foundation, uh, in which by installing uh, a limited number of sensors and by uh, promoting the concept of digital twin, uh, most probably we. Will will be able to to reduce uh, the the costs associated to, to to the maintenance of the foundation okay thank you very much 
Okay. Uh, maybe I, I continue with Javier. What is the major challenge and what about the transferability to other setups or, or technologies? Thank you, Vasilik. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, re regarding the, the first question, I would say that maybe the, 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 the biggest challenge in, in the project was or were the temporary stages. OK, we, we, we put uh, uh, so much attention in, in, in the concept, which are the, the self-floating foundation and, and the telescopic system, that uh, maybe we, we didn't, and it, it is an important lesson learned, we, we didn't uh, uh, pay uh, enough attention to the temporary stages, this meaning uh, uh, moreover the, the, the construction stage, okay? And I, I say this because the, the, the site in which we were uh, building the, the, the substructure was a very windy site, okay? In, in, in fact, we, we were not uh, very lucky because we had more wind at the construction site than the, the wind we had at the operating site, okay? But uh, because of that, we, we had more standby times that we had anticipated, okay? And, and this uh, was uh, affecting, of course, the, the, the schedule, okay? Eventually, we, we, we managed to, to succeed in time. But I think it's an important message that we, we, we and, and more, mostly for serial production, that we need to, to, to be very cautious about the, the, the weather conditions, not only uh, during installation and operation, but beforehand, okay? Cranes need a, a certain wind limits to operate, and there are other limitations that may may constrain the the the, the schedule. Okay, and yeah, regarding the, the the second question, in in our case, as mentioned, the the project is is finished, and and, and thanks to to the project and, and the funding, we, we are already engaged in in in, in some uh, commercial projects at different stages. But I would say that to, to even help further that uh, transferability from the research to, to the commercial deployment, I, I would encourage the, the different uh, uh, administrations and, and governments to uh, provide uh, or include more test sites uh, within commercial wind farms, okay? There, there are test sites in, in, in some of them or, or in many of them, but of course, there is a, a reasonable and understandable inertia from from developers to 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 proceed with uh, the known technologies and the known supply chains. So, I think that uh, having more opportunities for all the technologies to at certain commercial wind farms to have uh, the, the possibility to to the, introduce the the technology in two three units something like this that would would help much. Uh, that transferability to, to the market. OK, thank you very much. There is actually there was a question uh, before about the contribution of the ELISA technology to the LCOE. Of the yes, that's that, that's a good question. I, I would say that the, 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 the contribution it's uh, relies on, on on two aspects. OK, OK, one of of course is is the CAPEX because of the reduced, reduced uh, installation cost. And, and the other one is the o, o m for the substructure, okay? Uh, apart from that, for, for uh, regarding the, the wind turbine operation, it, it's exactly the same as with, with any other turbine, but regarding the substructure being made of, of concrete, it is designed, of course, to, to withstand much more than the 25, 30 years uh, design lifetime of commercial wind farms. Okay, thank you. There is also a question with, I believe it's also for uh, the Lisa uh, technology. Are there any synergies with Equinor Highway Dumpen projects? I, I don't know if this is for, for us, maybe it's for, for uh, flagship. Uh, uh. Yes, okay. Yeah, Isabel, so if you want to comment. <laughs> So, um, to be, I think that how in Champion they are uh, developing and still a platform, floating platform. So, uh, there are some things that may be, uh, might be applicable for this different technology. As I said, we are developing a concrete floating platform. So, um, 
yeah, I think it could be synergies, but uh, we, I think we are in different stages, the both projects, so how we campaign, it's in a later stage. So maybe in the future we will have some synergies, but right now um, we are still in the design phase. Okay, thank you. And since we started, maybe we get, I can continue with a question to you, Isabel. Uh, okay. What, you know, for, uh, you are still at an early stage, so maybe it's difficult to know what will be the major challenge, but I, I suppose it will <laughs> <Yeah>. be challenging. <laughs> no worries. It will be challenging um, to transfer the technology to other sea regions. Uh, how, how do you see this? So um, currently, apart from the challenges that I said during the presentation, one of the biggest one is to keep the project in budget, in budget to fabricate a single unit. It's expensive. So this is one of the major challenges. And it will be, uh, if we have a potential rise or the budget is higher than expected, this fabrication cost uh, might um, compromise the transferability of the fabrication process to a commercial scale project. But and we are still uh, in an early phase of the project, so we let, let's see in one year, one year and a half. Uh, but yes, this is one of the major challenges. But as in any other project, the budget is so is always a challenge because you have contingencies. But sometimes uh, things happen and you need to move. But uh, and. For example, these projects, uh, as I said, we are starting from scratch. So we are trying to, to use things that we know from a standard commercial project from, of bottom fix and trying to uh, customize the change in order to make them applicable to floating offshore winds. So we are learning each day. So there is also a challenge on that because you, you need to keep moving fast in order to, to go with the design, to go with the partners. And thank you for all the partners because we have experts in all the disciplines. So it um, allows us to move fast and move forward with this, this challenge of the technology. But it's also complicated when each week or each month you have a new challenge because some things are not in the same way, like in bottom fix, when, where we have more experience. Okay, thank you. There's also a question, how long will be the operation period? Uh, for the okay, so um, since we become operational, uh, we have uh, with the European Commission two years of this period where we plan to gather all the information and data as possible in order to try to understand better which is the behavior of the of the turbine how to adjust the control of the turbine in order to um, maximize the 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 power generation and also the behavior of the floating platform so uh, initially we will be running for two years but after that we still have the asset so Okay. We, we might continue. Uh, there are still some questions in the chat, but I suggest that maybe uh, the speakers, if you want, you can write uh, your answers directly in the chat, because I would like also to continue with the uh, two poll questions mm -hmm. for, uh, for the audience that we can also discuss here in the panel. So I will uh, share my screen. Uh, Vasiliki, one thing. I don't know what has happened to me, but I don't have access to the chat. So... Yes, maybe if you send me the question, I can give you the answer and yeah. you can post it. Thank you get, you. I will show it on the screen. Oh, okay, yes, thanks. in the chat. Yes, okay, sure, sure, I can do it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So I just wanted to, uh, to before I read the question for the, for the poll, I wanted to uh, explain to you how you can access the, the Slido poll. So I, I guess you can all see this S on the top menu of the Teams, yeah? So you can, once the poll will be active, uh, my colleague Raquel will activate this in a while, you will be able to see it if you click S or, or otherwise, uh, you can just uh, uh, connect uh, your browser with slido.com and use this code that you see on the screen or with the QR code that is here. Uh, so let's start with the first question. 
And uh, the first, so this is about, there are many innovative uh, technologies that uh, that can bring the costs uh, down, uh, the LCOE or improve the performance of wind farms or, or the revenues. And these are demonstrated and are, um, are proving their benefits. So I wanted to have uh, the opinion of the audience and of course also uh, of you. Among these elements that are on the on the screen, which one do you see? Which ones maybe you think are have the highest potential in in supporting uh, offshore wind growth? So what we have here is of course improving wind turbine technology, bigger wind turbines, and more powerful ones. The digitalization of operation and maintenance, uh, the digitalization of the wind farm conceptual design and construction. Uh, or maybe a focus on the circularity and recyclability of technologies, or maybe better interoperability uh, with offshore grids and other connected elements, or or just the optimization, maximization of of the revenues of the wind farms. So, I, I check now if the poll is already active. I think it's been activated now. Yeah, it is. So you can choose two options, and um, we can. Let's let's wait one minute until we get some answers. And of course, the speakers and can also answer if you, if you wish. I don't know if the results will be seen here or just in the slider. Let's wait until we close this until we close the okay. I think we can close the poll now if we received some questions already. <laughs> and uh yeah, let's continue maybe orally. Uh would you like to comment this question? Maybe Cesar, would you like to start? We take the same order as before. Uh, okay, I can I can get started. Uh, well, from my point of view, of course, it's not an easy question because, as you know, SEO is determined by many different factors. Uh, many of them are uh, such as uh, industrialization, economies of scale, digitalization. Um, however, if I analyze the, the list below, uh, at least to me, uh, the, the, the first one would be, uh, of course, to improve the the, uh, the uh, wind farm revenues optimization, uh, because in that case, of course, we will need to check how to be better integrate the, the wind farms uh, and together with uh, topics like provision of ancillary services, uh, combination or what is called the, the power to X uh, and services that could be provided by, by the offshore wind, wind farm assets. So that is really important. Uh, but also connected to this, of course, is the interoperability and, and the connection uh, of the offshore wind farms and the development of new network connections uh, within Europe or in, in the case of Europe, within Europe, in order to be able to, to exploit the, the huge potential for offshore wind. So in the end, it's like a combination of, of both topics to me uh, seem to be very interesting. And just one more from, the, from a purely technical point of view. Uh, improving wind turbine technology if, and if possible going to, to bigger turbines, of course, will be clearly affecting SCOE. So those will be the, the most important to me. I don't know if you have here or Isabelle, would you like to add something? Maybe. Um, well, I think it's, it was a really good answer, but I would also say, for example, the wind farm on MD situation. Um, I think that might be a good improvement because if we have, if we can like uh, try to monitor um, more 
the, the the assets in order to to increase the preventive um, maintenance. Maybe that could extend the time life of these wind farms, and I think that will be a good improvement. I mean, now we are speaking about 25 of uh, for a life, for, for sorry for the life of a wind farm. So maybe to extend it a little bit longer will be useful. Um, will support the energy growth. Thank you. And maybe you want to comment also, Javier? Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, I, I think I, I, I agree with, with both, particularly with Cesar. I have already answered the poll and, and I had chosen the first and the last, in fact. OK, and maybe just to point that regarding the first uh, on, on wind turbine is, is maybe not only the the size, but uh, I think that we might be in, in the verge of of, of um, having uh, new technologies that may help us uh, also reducing loads and therefore uh, reducing the size of the required substructures and in turn the, the, the overall capex in the projects. OK, thank you. And I see that also this, uh, so your, your replies are in line with with what uh, all the other participants replied. So it's, of course, the wind turbine technology, improved wind turbine technologies, but also uh, the optimization of, uh, of the re revenues overall, so everything. And we can continue maybe with, uh, we don't have so much time, but maybe we can continue quickly with a second question. Um, I hope you can see it on the screen. So which are the major challenges in scaling up um, the commercial uptake of, of innovative uh, technologies and solutions for offshore wind? Uh, would it be the development cost of the solutions or the cost of enabling other enabling infrastructure that is necessary to exploit the solutions? Would it be the need to provide to prove their benefits in different setups and uh, technologies as we discussed before? Uh, would it be just the cost to make them to adapt them to other setups or, or, um, or technologies? Is it a matter of data exploitation to manage uh, all this, uh, maybe what was mentioned before, or maybe even a skills shortage? So him, resources combining both uh, digitalization and wind engineering uh, expertise. I think the, the poll is already active, yeah, so you can vote. Oh, and actually we can maybe start commenting if someone of you has already uh, has already replied. Okay, I can get a study if you want, Vasiliki. Uh, from my point of view, and, and also Javier mentioned it, uh, this before, uh, one of the key points for, for many of the innovations and for the commercial uptake is the, the valley of death of many uh, companies or startups or, or innovative processes. So this is uh, really important, uh, being able to, to overpass this, uh, this uh, period. And some of the answers that you were mentioning here are, are, are affecting that. No? For, for instance, how to prove uh, the benefits for the various setups or turbine technologies, um, the, the, the the development costs of the of the solutions or, or the costs for, for the transferability are affecting this and, and are important topics trying to, to of course being able to to pass that situation and, and and to provide new innovations into the sector that are really needed. Thank you. Someone else, like Isabel or Javier, would you like to add something to this or contradict maybe? No, from, from my side I, I fully agree with with Cesar. In, in fact if I had to choose two of, of those uh, I would choose again uh, similar as uh, similar choice as Cesar so it, it would be one on four in this case okay the the, the, the development cost and 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 moreover the the cost of their transferability mm -hmm. to to various setups yeah so it's it's mostly a matter of technology maturity or uh, yeah, transferability at, at for now mm -hmm. okay I don't know, Isabelle, would you like to add? Something? No, I totally agree with Javier and Cesar. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can close, up, before we pass uh, to the wrap-up uh, part, maybe we can close the poll and see what was the reply. Yeah, so almost uh, yeah, the biggest uh, part uh, replied that is the development cost of these solutions, which actually explains why <laughs> we are discussing this in a research and innovation uh, session, right? Uh, so maybe thank you, say many thanks to all of you for the for the interesting insights. Um, I give the floor back to Carlos now.
for the for the closing remark. And good luck with the next steps in your developments. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And um, yeah, thank, thanks so much for all the speakers. I mean, I thought it was a, um, quite an interesting session. I mean, I think we, we touched a lot of um, uh, very interesting points, not only uh, with the Slido, but also uh, uh, obviously with, with the presentations. I mean, um, I think that uh, it touched um, a few points that I think it's going to be extremely important uh, moving forward. Uh, we had some presentations talking about the issues on uh, operation maintenance and durability, lifetime extensions, which I think it's something that uh, is it's really going to be um, extremely important uh, uh, looking forward, right? Um, if it's about reaching that um, um, carbon neutrality is about producing as much renewable energy as we can, this also means that it's making sure that uh, we can actually have a very reliable system that is it's, it's very long lasting. Um, we also had, I think, um, two presentations that were also particularly talking about something that is, is extremely important, something that we also tackled a lot um, in Horizon Zero, but which is also the issue on uh, dealing with industrialization, is mass, uh, mass production, is smart manufacturing. This is something that um, um, within Horizon Zero, you can actually see it um, sprinkled over Cluster 5, which is the one that's dealing specifically with renewable energy generation, but also in Cluster 4, which is the one that's really dealing with um, industrial uh, uh, processes and, and manufacturing. And I think that this is um, something that ends up being a, a very important point, right? It's not only about um, producing it in a sustainable way, in a, in, in a circular way, it's not about uh, only about um, us uh, investing in this kind of a new research and new developments and innovation, but it's also about being able to scale this up and deploy this at, at, a, at, a, at a level that actually can make an impact. Yeah. So I think that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm particularly, I think I took a lot of lessons uh, uh, from today. I hope that you also did. I think that uh, th there's definitely a lot of food for thought there. I think that uh, this is obviously a kind of a um, a few projects that uh, we've been very pleased to to fund uh, across Europe. There is many more that have been extremely successful. Some that are still on uh, ongoing or are very very promising, uh, and there are many more to come. Right? I mean, I think that um, it's important that you, you can see that there is a certain red thread that is connecting all those different things according to different policies that that we have in mind. Um, having that said, I also quite like these slider discussions now. I thought it, it, it was interesting to have almost a bit of a meta look into this, detaching ourselves a bit from, from the real projects and just looking at a bit on what are cross-cutting um, across it. Obviously, um, um, as um, Vasilik just, just pointed out, I mean, we are uh, I'm particularly working at research and innovation, so I, well, I'm pleased to see that um, the segments or the sector does see that there are still some challenges at, at that level. Um, we are uh, we are working on this, and obviously it's something that uh, we, we want to see more of a cooperation also between our sides and see how we, we can actually really move this forward to reach the goals that we want to reach. I think I don't want to add much more than this. So th thanks again for the invitation uh, to be here. And um, yeah, my, my, ple my pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much, Carlos, for this uh, uh, for this uh, conclusory note. It's a very interesting insight also about the smart manufacturing that you mentioned. So once again, I would like to thank all of you uh, for for the discussion, for your questions, and for uh, for your participation, for listening to this. Have a good lunch and a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you, Vasilgi, and thank you all. Thank you, thank you very Mike. much, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.